Hey there, and welcome back to the Shuffle Squads channel where we're going to do another meta forecast for you. EUIC has ended in London, and now we're moving on to the Orlando regionals in Florida. We're going to be looking at the exact same format, but maybe some new takes on decks after EUIC is completed. I have a lovely panel of guests here joining me for this meta forecast, as always, so I'm going to rip it over to them so they can introduce themselves. What we're going to do is start out with the one and only Jake Gearhart. Jake, why don't you tell the people a little bit about yourself and where uh, they should know you from? Yeah, I'm Jake Earhart. You probably know me from Twitter. Um, I, yeah, I'm very, very active on there. Uh, yeah, just got back from EYC. Uh, I didn't like do all that all that well there. Uh, yeah, pr pretty poor performance actually, but I did get top 1024, so I'm almost at my invite now. Uh, so pretty happy about that. Very cool. And uh, you did choose to play... Uh, very vanilla-ish deck, but there was some weird text. We'll talk about that later on. Um, the next person that you should know, also if you pay attention to Pokemon uh, in any way, shape, or form, especially on the main stages, is Ethan Heggy. Ethan, why don't you introduce yourself? Hey, my name's Ethan. Uh, I talk too much about Pokemon sometimes, uh, including new formats. And uh, yeah, we get more Pokemon this weekend, so excited to get into it. Perfect. And last but definitely not least, we do have Jared Grimes joining us here, um, the creator of Pokestats. Uh, but <laughs> Jared, why don't you Dang. let the people know <laughs> a little bit about yourself and uh, where the people should know you from? Yeah. Hey, everyone. Um, Jared, uh, I did make uh, that thing. Uh, <laughs> I've also played Chim Pao way too much yes. uh, for the last. I think we're going on 12 tournaments uh going strong uh and got my invite off of chin power and just i just like the deck and playing it so we're gonna keep doing that yes and everybody here is a very worldly and and intelligent player so that's why i wanted to bring everybody to talk about how these decks are going to change into the next couple of major regionals because people are going to try to scrape up those last points to get their world's invites uh we do know that the dates have been released for honolulu for the world championship so now it's time to put your thinking hat on and talk about what these decks are going to look like going forward into the next regionals uh the first deck i do want to talk about and we're going to talk to you jake uh, first is Charizard. Now, we did see the control Charizard, and we saw it towards Charizard. So what do you think about Charizard EX and how the changes are going to affect Orlando? Yeah, I think there's a, a lot of interesting things to take from EYC as far as Charizard goes. Uh, like, I and a bunch of other players played the Reggie Lecky in there to try and make the the normal stall uh, Snorlax matchup better. Uh, and also it has some some use cases into Chen Pao and the Mirror, where you can recycle Eerie or TM Devo um, and sort of lock your opponent out of the game using that. Um, there's also yeah plenty of other ways to play it. Uh, like like Tord uh, brought the Bibarel with the Pidgeot um, and the Cleffa, which uh, William Azevedo also played. Um, and that's a that's a card I I really like in the deck. I actually tested mm -hmm. it, but with the Bibarel uh, Charizard, and it felt kind of weak in there. But uh, yeah. feel, putting it in Pidgeot. Uh, seems like it has a lot more, uh, a lot better of a place there. Um, and it also like counteracts Spiritomb, which is nice. Um, yeah. But I think Charizard going forward, uh, it's going to be really interesting to see where lists go um, because I think uh, the Bibarel uh, definitely makes uh, the mirror like a, a lot better for you, just being able to draw out of situations where you get IONO TM Devoed. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, now that Bibero is like a known quantity, people are going to be playing it alongside other mirror techs. Um, so the Charizard mirror is like uh, one of my favorite matchups. It's just very, very interesting. Um, it's sort of, uh, it's it's a very complicated matchup, but in a different right. way than something like the Gardevoir mirror last format, uh, where the Gardevoir mirror was uh, all about like, like very little changes could change how you play the game because it was all about uh what what's the probability that my opponent draws this resource at this time uh, and how do i stop them from drawing what they need where the the charizard mirror feels feels like uh, it's a very uh like solvable mirror uh, but there's mm. tons of different lines and each oh, like yeah. card count changes things um so it's it's almost like i, I think of it almost like chess where you're yes. uh, like playing different uh with different openings different pieces and mm -hmm. 
each line can take you in a completely different direction. Um, so yeah, I, I think I think people will end up teching more and more for Charizard Mirror. Um, but Charizard does seem to be like a pretty solid uh, top yeah. of the format deck. Uh, and I think it'll stay there for, for the rest of the format. Absolutely. And, and that's actually how I was describing Cleffa to a lot of the people who are looking at towards the list. You know, Cleffa is a pawn, basically, in chess because you are putting it out there. It's basically a pseudo Rotom V, but it is also a pawn because you want your opponent to almost attack it. So you, now your damage output is higher and higher. So I really did like that tack. I think that we will start to see more of that in Charizard because we used to see Mew from Celebrations as one of those, you know, pawn style of Pokemon. Um, so Ethan, would you agree or disagree that maybe these control-ish style Charizards are probably the way to go? I mean, I definitely took down the biggest events so far, so people have definitely have to, when they're thinking about Charizard, think to themselves, A, how many people are going to play this style of list, and right. B, how does it really affect the mirror matchup in terms of what people are going to bring? I mean, yeah. it's going to be no surprise that Zard is probably showing up in... I mean, we saw 22% last weekend. Yeah, Got to expect wild. it to still be over 20%, most likely for this event, mm -hmm. especially because it won and especially because the deck is still good, right? People have been preparing and playing with this deck. Not a lot that happened at EYC is going to deter people necessarily from playing this deck. Yeah, and I think Towards deck brings a lot of the pieces and the problems that Charizard had together, mm -hmm. like the Barrel, like the Turo for things like Control and Stall that were pretty bad matchups on paper. Yeah. And it makes it pretty solid, right? So you have to imagine that a lot of people are going to bring this deck and therefore people have to be prepared. They've got at least a little yeah. bit of idea of what sort of variants exist. We know there's just the typical Pidgeot Charizard variant. We now know there's Tords variant. And then we also saw this Regilecki variant going around. Mm -hmm. So I think that will be very interesting of sort of this dynamic, right? We thought yeah. that the first weekend it would just be Pidgeot the Barrel versus Pidgeot Charizard. Uh, or uh, Pidgeot and Charizard and the Barrel and Charizard. But now mm. it's sort of Pidgeot very much, no matter what deck you're playing, will be the core. But mm -hmm. how do you sort of add these other pieces in Charizard and how do they affect the mirror in your spreads? Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I, I do think that uh, we definitely got a better peek into the future with these, these few decks that we did see uh, excel in the tournament. Now, uh, talking about Regilecki a little bit more in Charizard, Jared, are you afraid... <laughs> of Regilecki, uh, or should we all be afraid of Regilecki a little bit more for those decks that are reliant on rare candy? Uh, well, especially with the rare candy and the, and the eerie, right? Like I, I don't think that's like, especially with the eerie, like into something like chip out is very insanely item dependent. I don't think that the rare candies are that tricky because you can always just use them. And then you sure. do one in your hand, you're going to irritate, you fetch it out. Um, when you use Regilecki into something like Chen Pao, uh, you kind of need to, uh, I guess, gain a, a, a lot of advantage like immediately. Um, what by that I mean, like, let's say, like, Chen Pao, like, just doesn't they use their prime catcher, they don't have a way to like go iron hands into the Regilecki by like using double bib, which they should have anyways. But, um, I think it's really good for like capitalizing on like weak i guess like board states and when it's kind of set up like that and kind of if you already hit the eerie on like a couple items you can kind of throw up the regilecki and you say all right i'm gonna get like this eerie again and then i know mm -hmm. that uh you're already down like a superior and you're gonna have to use another one for this knockout i'm just i just need one more to like finish that but sure. i don't know if i kind of know that you're playing regilecki i might just be like i'll just kind of be aware of that and uh, kind of hold the prime catcher, kind of try to do my prize routing a little bit differently. Um, but it definitely is something to consider. Um, I think that for like, at least which version I'm probably expecting to see is probably just the thing that won. So nice. I don't know how many people will play Regilecki. I think just a lot of people kind of came to that same conclusion, which is interesting. Like I'm gonna play Regilecki. I was like, I'm gonna play Regilecki. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it almost makes you think People are just going to play Regilecki, but at the same time, it's like Torrid had a very distinctive, like, let's play uh, double Turo and Team Yelstier. And I also saw Team Yelstier, like, one of my yeah. opponents played it, like, day one. He, I, I think he did pretty well day two as well um, with that Team Yelstier. And it just kind of makes you think that, like, we're kind of coming to this convergence. To this, It'll be interesting to see whether people converge to this Regilecki or mm -hmm. uh, the Team Yelstier. But 
yeah. One of them is going to be the way to go for sure. Exactly. We can call it Puzzle of Time Charizard EX. But... Puzzle of Time. <laughs> um, now, going back to you, Ethan, we were kind of touching on uh, some of the decks uh, beforehand, and, and you're a big follower of the Japanese meta, as am I, right? Uh, we did see Lugia win the Champions League, but Lugia didn't necessarily perform, and it does take a pretty good Charizard matchup uh, on paper. So what do you think about Lugia into Orlando? Do you think that we're going to see a, a better resurgence of Lugia, or maybe what was Lugia's problem at UIC? I think for the most part, Lugia had like a lot of pressure on its back. I think people sort of had this expectation for the deck to maybe perform a little bit better than it did. That's not to say one bad showing at the start of the format makes or breaks sort of how a deck functions. I think Lugia mm -hmm. is still inherently very, very strong. It's just some of the other decks have more stable routes in their game plan. And that's, sure. I think, one of the, Lugia's biggest issues is how consistently does it get sort of that really great board state of yeah. Devil Archeops on turn two, and then the Chinchino set up and doing everything. So I don't think just because the deck didn't get a lot of slots within the top 32 that it will disappear by any means. I mean, there was one on winning in for the last round. It was still very, very close to making it into top cut. Mm -hmm. um, and the deck still has a fairly good spread. I mean, if you look at the, the top two decks that did well at the tournament, right? You have Charizard, yeah. which is a deck that Lugia is very close to slightly here matchup, depending on how its variance goes. And then you have Giratina, another deck that Lugia on paper is, right. is good into if it's playing cards like Snorlax that are very good against these Lost Sun decks. So I think it's still a very, very good play for this weekend. I think it has a lot of good matchups. It just, it's, it's hard in these big fields, right? Where you have yeah. over 250 players in day two. Some people are going to go on real good runs. Some people aren't. There's not a flexibility. So I think when people start to maybe look past the top eight a little bit more and see, mm -hmm. okay, well, this deck still has lots of good matchups. It's still statistically very good into things like control into things like block it's doesn't really have any auto loss matchup so to say people maybe mm -hmm. will start to see that the deck's still a very very good play got it and uh jake would you agree disagree that you know lugia is one of the most consistent decks in in the format it has a great matchup spread uh what are your thoughts on lugia yeah i mean i i don't think lugia is a very consistent deck uh just because it has to <laughs> has to get the the whole combo off pretty right. early in, in order to play the game. But I think one of the reasons why it didn't do well at EUIC uh, or do as well as, as it could have is just that very few top players were playing it. Uh, and I think this format is very, uh, very skill oriented. Like there's a lot of benefit for, for being a good player. Right. Um, and while you can just pick up a Lugia deck um, and play it, there are like a lot of intricate situations in some of the top matchups uh, like against charizard one of the things um that i found from a little bit of testing like with and against lugia um is that you don't want to use your summoning star until like you're in a position to start loading up energies on chinchino because one of the ways mm -hmm. you can easily lose that matchup is if charizard can immediately counter catcher and ko an archaeops and you don't have a chinchino to respond to their charizard um, right so i think for the most part they're uh people uh, who just picked up Lugia, um, maybe not have a ton of time to test and, and are going into this event. They might have not picked up on some of those lines at play where uh, where you really need to be um, be careful of your, your resources with energy cards and, and when you choose to use Summoning Star, um, how passive you can be with Read the Wind, when you can afford to give up prize cards to, to build up your board better. Um, I th I, yeah, I think there's a, a little bit of uh, sort of outplay or, or skill that can be put into the deck uh, it's it's definitely not one of the the hardest decks to play, but there is still um, that that sort of floor where you get to get past. Um, but I'd also be kind of scared to play Lugia in the future because uh, the two Iron Hands decks just top eight at the UIC, yeah. and the, that's a pretty rough matchup. Oh yeah, that's definitely uh, terrible. But let's let's talk a little bit more about decks with uh, some Iron Hands, Jared. I want to talk to you a little bit more about. Uh, Lost Zone box because we did obviously see Isaiah Bradner make second place at UIC with Lost Zone Giratina. Uh, we've seen a lot of hype around regular Lost Zone box. So what are your personal thoughts about uh, Lost Zone box overall, uh, whether it's played with a Giratina in there as just Lost Zone Tina or Paradox box that was another deck that was heavily hyped going into this event. Um, do you think that we're going to see some more Lost Zone decks, some more flower selecting? Yeah, I think I mean I think the main reason why we're kind of 
I guess haven't really been seeing that as much is I think Lost One Box has notoriously been this sort of deck where it's like, okay, you really have to have really tight lines and sequencing to be able to operate the deck at like kind of a normal level. Like whereas Lugia, you can just kind of, you know, you you might not know the lines we have to hold the summoning star, but you might just use the summoning star and then you're still still able to probably win games with Lost Box. You can't just use the comfies and you know because yeah. you still have to you know count all your energies you have to mirage gate you have to do everything exactly right the skill floor is like quite high with lost box and so we don't really see a whole lot of players pick it up mm-hmm. um i was actually real like i think that was the one kind of miss i made on the euic meta is i was expecting like lost sex to have like a pretty high um you know showing and i was expecting like lost box to be specifically like on par with tina and i was completely wrong about that because uh i guess there was just so many people at euic and the people there were people who played lost box um but i guess just there weren't that many of them and in the field that big you can just get out variants right. um but i still think it's good like i still think it has like the matchup spread i think is like decent like zard i think is like from my experience like i don't like it's probably i don't think it's great but like it's doable like hands is like it doesn't seem good, but like it's doable. Like if you're mm-hmm. able to like um it runs like at least the one I played, like ran like the bundles. You can like bundle up and then like take a quick two and then like even if the hands you have like the hoopa. So like I, I don't know. I think it's pretty decent. Um and then as for Tina, I think Tina is like in a really good spot. Like we saw a lot of like really, really good players all yeah. play Tina. So that's really saying something. I think Tina just has a really solid matchup spread and obviously holds its own into Charizard and um and I guess I, I guess they put the Bennett in because they didn't think it had that good of a control matchup, but I don't know. I haven't played much of that, so um, yeah. I would expect it has a pretty good control matchup anyways, but um, I still think it's in a pretty good spot. Just uh, selecting power, selecting flowers is kind of pain sometimes. It so is good. might deter people off. Gotcha. Uh, well, anybody that's watching this that played back in the 2018-2019 uh, uh, era, Ethan, do you think that uh, Lost Zone Box is the Malamar of this format? Uh, um i would probably say that lugia is more of the malamar of this format uh, in terms okay. of like yeah. just having what it needs every turn and going through a checklist yeah, yeah. i wouldn't really give it that description okay. they're two very very different decks yes i think jared kind of hit the nail on the coffin there really though that just like lost zone definitely very very popular deck mm-hmm. they're definitely a very powerful deck but it does take a lot to pilot it and Correct. i think that's what a lot of people were very deterred for to do at EUIC because of how sort of skewed the international championships are in terms of points. Okay. And you got to bring your best. If you're not feeling confident with it, you can't bring it. And I think after this weekend, we should probably be seeing a lot more lost box mm-hmm. than we saw last weekend. It's very clear the deck is still good. Pedro got top 16 with it. Right. Uh, and it's one of those decks that always is sort of a good pick because you can always build the deck to have answers to things. And nice. I think now that, People have found lists that have worked out very well. I know a lot of people really liked how Pedro built his deck. We could just be seeing a lot more of that because it's got good matchups. It's got good potential. That's exactly. Lost Box 3. Yeah, no, I, I mean, Mew EX is also a broken card. But yes, Jake, I would love to hear your opinions on, on Lost Zone Box. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, I, I kind of disagree a little bit. I think Lost Box is sort of going to head in a, a downwards trajectory um, in, in oh, favor okay. of Tina, um, one of the I was I was actually very close to playing Lost Box for EUIC, but then I started hearing about the the Reggie Alecki eerie stuff, um, and that's sure. a that's a huge problem for Lost Box. Um, like eerie mm-hmm. already was uh, like one eerie is already pretty sketchy, um, but a second one and maybe a third with Palpat or or just multiple sure. Reggie Alecki's eeries, you can just get locked out of the game um, through mm-hmm. that. Um, so now more people know about the Reggie Alecki combo. We'll see more of it in Charizard. Um, it'll be difficult to get wins against that. Uh, and then also with Ancient Box um, and the sort of the Moon Moon to Dunsparce deck, um, mm. those both are problems for Lost Box. Uh, 140 HP basic that just does a decent amount of damage is really, really tough to get through. Um, so I think like you know, the one way you can sort of counter that is by playing uh, the Cobalion in Lost Box, so your Iron Hands can one shot uh, the Roaring Moon, and then you can also like one shot a Charizard EX um, with a Mew EX earlier. Um, so there's there's a little bit of flexibility there. Um, but the Eerie Eerie Regieleki is really what put me off the deck, um, and I think Tina is a, a has a better chance against that kind of strategy because mm-hmm. uh, Tina tends to be able to play its Mirage Gates preemptively. Um, right. 
in the Charizard matchup. You can set up multiple Tinas. And then you also got your Iron Leaves, which can move a bunch of energy that are on random things. Um, right. So you can play all those cards right away as soon as you see them. Uh, whereas like the traditional Lost Box deck, you have to set up your attackers on the turn you're using them. Um, so I'd be very, very uh, wary of playing Lost Box um, in the near future. Right, just because if Airy becomes a more more popular card, that's uh, it spells bad news for a lot a lot of Mirage Gate style of decks. Um, now, uh, there's a topic I know that I, I had mentioned to everybody prior to the podcast, but seems as though I, I've missed it here. But we're gonna go back to you, Jake, and talk a little bit about this control stall. These were all decks that we saw in in numbers in day two because they excelled at beating a lot of the higher count decks, right? That we know that the meta was kind of shaped towards these things like Chen Pao, Charizard. Lugia is a pretty bad matchup for these decks, to be honest with you. But, you know, a lot of these decks out in the field, we're seeing that Stahl had a pretty decent matchup now with Eerie being added into these decks. So what is your take on Control and Stahl uh, into this new format now that we've seen what came out of EUIC? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Snorlax in general as a card is is not that uh, powerful in this format. Um, I think the Pidgeot, Mawile, uh, Radiant Charizard build is by mm -hmm. far better than that. Um, you just have so much more options um, and yeah. can pull off the same locking strategy against most things, um, especially with like Tord's deck playing the uh, effectively five gust effects in a game right. Like you're not going to win with, uh, with Snorlax or Turos as well. Um, yeah. You're not going to win with the, the regular quad Snorlax, but the Pidgeot control version has a better shot. Um, I think... Uh, Giratina's a little bit sketchy, but but the the matchups got a lot better this format. Um, Tina has less uh, path bump or has less stadium cars in the deck, uh, and they don't have path to shut off your Rotom and Pidgeot, um, so sure. they can get their energies can get locked out with Temple of Sinnoh, um, and then mm. they're also yeah weak to sort of that the like fast Charizard end game uh, where they can right. run out of run out of ways to accelerate energy. Uh, and then get their big attacker knocked out. Um, so I think it's I think it's in a solid spot. Um, but I would be worried about um, sort of a, an influx of the ancient box decks this next weekend in mm -hmm. Orlando, um, okay. because the the Moon Moon Dunsparce deck got top eight um, yeah. in Masters, and then ancient box won in Seniors with uh, Gabriel Fernandez. Um, Vinny also played uh, that deck in Joao um, in in the Masters, and both did well there. Uh, so I think the, those builds uh, will be on the rise, and those are pretty tough matchups for control decks yeah, in general. Um, you can sort of flood your board with things that uh, all can attack. Um, but I, I think that the deck, as long as Charizard sort of on top, um, then there will always be a place for control in the format. Um, because yeah, even even though like Tord played the the Yells Cheer Double Turo Boss Prime Catcher, uh, it's still possible to beat him. It, it's still not not even that difficult the matchup's close right. but it's not like uh unfa Unwinnable. not too unfavored uh luxray is such a powerful card um yes. and cloth ex uh mm -hmm. is also a really great card um <laughs> for the charizard matchups um so yeah there's there's a lot of a lot of uh a lot the that control could go in the future and to play like a lot of cards that control decks could play uh, to answer sort of everything in the format um and i'll also mention that that Bonnet ex in um in the, the Tina deck, I think that's more for the, the Chen Pao matchup, really. It can mm -hmm. be annoying um, to play against as a control player, but uh, usually you can sort of play around the, the Poltergeist um, if you if you know it's coming. Right, exactly. You can just uh, jump out too. It's okay. That's true. I'm chilling. <laughs> yeah. I don't care. <laughs> but that doesn't scare anyone. It's, no. It's, uh, it's fine. Uh, Ethan, I want to hop back to you because Jake mentioned a couple of cards. We did see in Control List, we did see the Cloth. We did see the Luxray come back. We saw some baby Luxray in some lists. We saw Great Tusk EX. Uh, so out of all of these, what was your favorite Control Tech card that you saw on some of these lists? Uh, in terms of like value, I think Luxray V, like Jake mentioned, is yes. just a card that is good against a lot of things, right? Just mm -hmm. bringing something up or just having it active, especially early on if your opponent doesn't have a fast start against Charizard, right? That's usually yeah. matchup is, I think, pretty tough if they ever wear Candy their Pidgeon to play and they still have something like Yelchir or Double Turo. It's pretty tough if they can start getting the ball going to get Pidgeot established and you can't really trap anything, but. 
before that, if you can fang snipe away some rare candies, get rid of some pieces, slow them down enough, you do have a chance to get into a game if you play a combination of cards. I also really like to see the devolution in a few decks as yes. well that I saw for there. That was another strong way to get back into Charizard. Uh, the deck's got a lot of really good inclusions that it can play. I think still the biggest issue is it's on a lot more people's radars for this weekend. I right. know there were a lot of top players who were discussing and prepared to play against this deck and clearly it showed up and good players decided to pilot it mm -hmm. uh, but sort of what we saw is like as we got to the top and of course as we get into top cut right the time rules of course don't benefit it. players understand how to play against these decks more so than your average player is going to know how to play through it rounds one through i mean the competition is still tough regardless right. of how many people there are but um yeah i think that's the best part i mean i still have to like reread what great tusk ex does in that deck and like this card's a stadium or something for 40 yeah. so you know what I'm, I'm all happy to see people get in there and, and some cloth action is always fun to see that's well. true too we love cloth uh jared what would you tell a person that is seeing these control lists do well and they say i'm gonna go to orlando and pick up control um what type of suggestions would you give them if they're playing control yeah uh i think i think uh i forgot who said but i definitely i think jake you said that, that like the pidgeot control is like definitely the way to go over the snorlax because mm -hmm. i think uh it's just like mawile is such a good card like <laughs> mawile i think um uh icatrophy didn't didn't yeah. even run the snorlax no, no snorlax no snorlax at all in his deck uh because of that it's just like yeah and of course like the snorlax just gets bundled away mm -hmm. or just whatever so i think that the Pidgey control is very good to go, but very like well positioned. Um, and I, yeah, I don't even think it struggles. Like I think was talked about. I don't even think it struggles against the Tord one that much. Like you still have the Fang Snipe. You still like, you just have like Chi Yu with a cape and mm -hmm. you know, your classic, you just mill it. Oh, I'm just going to penny. I'm just going to mill. Mm -hmm. Hey, hit like a yells cheer. I'm like chilling. Um, I Lux Ray, a rare candy. I'm chilling. It's like, there's just so many, like yeah. you're just in, in like a really good spot. Uh, because Zard can't really apply like a massive amount of early game pressure. Right. Um, so yeah, play the Pidgey one. I think it's good. Perfect. Yeah. Before we I move mean, on, I... I'll... Oh. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, but before we move on, I'll, I'll also mention uh, one thing I, I really love from Alessandro's list is sort of the the Thornton package that he's yes. included. I think I that added that. so much to the deck. Um, being able to like pivot out of your Luxray into Buffalant is such mm -hmm. a powerful play, uh, and that Noivern as well for the the Iron Hands deck. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, if you're if you're gonna play control, I I definitely include that sort of package yeah. of cards. I uh, I almost played Thornton in my Vancouver list when I was playing Pidgeot control. Obviously, uh, Spirit Tomb stomped me into the ground uh, at that event. Uh, but Thornton was such a great card. Uh, Giovanni's Charisma was another one that I had in there. Uh, very cool to get Bouffant out onto the field, but that was. Uh, a couple of really good conclusions, and I think they actually do get better the more deeper that we get into the format, for sure. Um, so talking about a newer deck, I want to go back to you, Ethan, here. We're going to talk about Dino Box. Uh, we've got Ancient Box, Dino Nuggies, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> um, we've got all kinds of names for this deck, and we did see the Double Moon list also. So what are we thinking about these Ancient Box decks? Um, give me your, your true thoughts going into Orlando. Uh, I think that in terms of spreadsheet, in terms of what it has to offer, the deck's very, very solid. It's got good matchups in two. A plethora of things, whether it's the power of Flutter main just kind of sitting in the active and slowing down some of the Lost Zone decks, whether it's just the high damage output, and sort of like Jake mentioned, I mean, you're one prizer that hits hard, and you've got more than 120 HP, right? So you mm -hmm. sort of offset that weakness that a lot of those one prizers have to things like Iron Hands EX. Yeah. Uh, I, think, I think my biggest issue that I have with a deck is generally its consistency at times can sort of falter later on. Mm -hmm. um, sort of what I also saw in terms of watching the Japanese metagame from the Champions League to after the Champions League is uh, after that first Champions League, the deck went through a similar surge where a lot more people played it to things like City Leagues. Mm. And then after playing to City Leagues, the deck started to convert very, very poorly in terms yes. of win percentage and in terms of how much it made top cut. Mm -hmm. And then eventually just went from being a tier two deck to, I mean, falling out of favor and really just not right. seeing a lot of play at all. So this may be the event where people have this idea in their head that the deck is good, but I think people understand that it's not going to be a surprise that this deck sees more play percentage and 
there are some issues still in terms of how the deck functions. It can always get Roxanne and something like Ninja can get trapped. There's mm -hmm. a, a lack of pivoting cards sometimes. It kind of just wants to hit hard and be a beats deck deck at a lot of times. And while it can be deceptively hard at times for piloting the deck and your sequencing you have to do, there's still some things about it that I think don't jump out at me. Like, yeah, this is 100% an obvious play. Like, we have to play this deck for this weekend if you're going. Right, absolutely. Uh, now, going to you, Jared, uh, we did see, obviously, the difference in decks. We saw, you know, Vinny Fernandez just piloting the straight-up Ancient Box, and then the Dedun Sparse to help out with the draw engine. So are you are we thinking that we're going to see more Dedun Sparse in these style of decks? Because we don't see Bibarel in anything like this. You don't want to put that as a space on your board. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? I love the Dunsparce. <laughs> Top tier card. I love that yeah. card. I haven't figured out what to play it in yet, but that card is awesome. Uh, I don't know if it's placed in Ancient Box. I think it's kind of in this weird situation where it's like if you're playing a Dunsparce, like you might as well play Pokey Gear and then, you know, secure that supporter for turn. Mm -hmm. um, the the Dunsparce also has like free retreat, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Like you can like dark patch or you can just kind of chill with it in the active uh, instead of just like, you know, attaching energy to active pass and not really having like a, a, a pivot. Um, so it's definitely nice in that regard. Um, the list at top eight was a little weird. It had like tracking shoes and yeah. like, I think only like a couple stop. And I, I like, I don't know. I think I'd rather just play like three pokey stops uh it was like the the heavy cried on because you're also giving up the flutter mains with mm -hmm. if i remember correctly you're giving up the flutter mains which means you can't have it in the active and it's also not an ancient card to discard so i don't know i think that with the power of ancient box as it is with like i'm just gonna dump as many ancient cards into this card uh i don't know if the Dunsparce is the way to go but that card's really fun so i'm not gonna i'm not gonna hate against it awesome and and jake would you agree or disagree that flutter main is a broken card and Coridon's a pretty bad card, right? Uh, that's the way I feel, at least. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I very much agree with that. Um, mm -hmm. I also want to point out, I think the the although like the the both the Moon Moon deck and the normal Ancient Box deck use like uh, the Roaring Moon, the baby Roaring Moon as your like main attacker, uh, they mm -hmm. sort of serve like very different functions. Right. Uh, like the based on how many Ancient cards you play in the deck, uh, so like the the Dedun Sparse version is really not trying to get any one at KOs with it. It's just trying to use it as like an offset in the prize trade, right. uh, something to lead with to make your opponent do something about it. It's very annoying for Charizard to just sit against a booster capsule thing that just knocked out, or is just, just in the active um, where you, you can't hit it. You got to find your vacuum right away. Um, mm -hmm. Or like Tina as well. It's yeah. a very annoying card to deal with. Um, so I think I think in that in that deck its purpose is really just to, to be annoying. Um and then in the other deck, um it's sort of your main you're you're trying to get as many ancient cards in the discard as possible. Um so the decks have like sort of similar matchup spreads, mm -hmm. um, but they they do seem like slightly different in terms of function. Yeah. Um I, I really like the the moon moon deck more than the the regular ancient box. Um just it, it seems more more flexible, um, has more like less less sort of weaknesses to uh, like Charizard is a is a kind of a problem for the the other ancient box like the right. the normal single prize ancient box deck where it's a bit easier with the Roaring Moon, um, Tina's a bit better with Roaring Moon as well like the the EX I keep calling it Roaring Moon <laughs> because they're the, they're the same though I gotta I gotta get same used to same it. but different. yeah. Um, but yeah, Dunsparce, like Dunsparce having free retreat is, is really why the card is is even played, like over Bivaril. Um, just because that deck like doesn't play any switching cards. Mm -hmm. Um so Bivaril Bivaril would probably be a better card if it had free retreat. Um right. but Dunsparce uh, has that has that unique aspect of yeah. it that it can always get out of the active, uh, which is a pretty pretty cool thing about the card. Awesome. Yeah, and I mean, I, I really do like the decks. I like the way that we're seeing some builds for sure. But um, what we have to do now is kind of pivot and talk about another deck. And we're going to ask the expert here. So, Jared, I'm going to flip over to you and talk about Chen Pao a little bit after EUIC. Uh, do we think that Chen Pao is fully cooked? Uh, do we think that maybe uh, Chen Pao just didn't have a good performance because people didn't know how to build the correct 60? What are your thoughts here? Uh, so I definitely think that Chen Pao 
can win an event. Mm -hmm. Like I, I like Owen did it. So Same. I have more hope. I was losing hope and then Owen did it. And I was like, all right, I think we can do this. <laughs> um, I think that as for the perfect cook 60, it's like, uh, I, I, I tried to cook for EYC. I played like boxed order, which I really liked. I would just raw start it and then just win the game. I was like, this is cool. Mm -hmm. Um, I played spirit tomb for control and that like that won me control. I was like, okay, cool. Um, so, and, and like with the cypher maniac is like really improved consistency. You can really improve consistency with cards like ditto as well. You can mm -hmm. buddy pop and ditto, um, get your setups, but even with all of that, it does kind of lose to itself sometimes. So even um, with everything said and done, uh, Shinpao is kind of a deck that sometimes loses to itself. As to why it hasn't, uh, I guess, top eight at any, I, any IC. I don't know what we're doing, guys. We need to <laughs> step it up. That's crazy. Um, I think it really just comes down to Shinpao, like being very de like it's very deceptively difficult to play i think it looks very easy to play mm -hmm. but it's actually very hard to play like yeah. i'm still like like i've played it for a lot of events and even i'm just like looking at these hands i'm like what do i nest ball for like i have no idea i'm just like can they get this what are the odds of this um and it's just like if you sequence anything wrong, you can just get like so heavily punished. It reminds me of Lost Box, honestly. Yeah. Like to a certain extent, you get like these middle middle of the variance hands that are just like I can discard and draw up and probably swing myself back in the game. But and I feel like it deters a lot of people because a lot of people don't see this and they're like, Chevy Chill conceal cards, and then they get kind of got your backs. I own kill backs, and you're like. Ah, noodles, I have no bib rolls. It's like, well, you could have set those up and uh, drawn cards. Uh, so I feel like that's kind of what's deterred people from playing. Although I do have hope because at EYC, it was still the number two deck, which right. honestly blew me away because I was expecting, I was like, all right, Chim Pao probably won't have a high day one, but if it does have a high day one, it's going to have a very low day two. But it didn't. It was still the number two deck, which kind of gives me hope. I'm just like, all right, people are people are cooking. People are people are playing Chim Pao. Yeah. I think a lot of it has to do with the, the consistency bumps. Um, but I there's got to be more cooking to be done. I think that there's like always more cooking to be done. Uh, <laughs> so I'll see what I could do for Orlando. <laughs> there we go. Well, we have faith in you for Orlando here. I'll try. Um, and and Ethan, as far as uh, taking a look at the deck, I know that there's something that we didn't necessarily see, but we did, again, going back to the Japanese meta, we see um, people in the Elite Four were adding some cards that we didn't necessarily have in some of these. Uh, Kyogre was one of those cards. Are we thinking that we'll eventually start to see Kyogre start to land in these lists for Chen Pao? Uh, I mean, you can make the argument for it being okay, but mm. I think at the end of the day, it's not a make or break factor for sure. the deck being successful in an event and not being successful. So I think the biggest thing, again, will be uh, players are still getting used to the new format, right? Players are still mm -hmm. seeing what works in the best of three environment compared to the best of one environment. Right. Uh, and really, it's a lot of it comes down to sequencing, getting that good run with the deck, and then also having a run where you're drawing well, too, and you're getting good pieces, since that's also an issue the yeah. deck can have sometimes. So Kyogre, it's a cool card. It has some good use against some decks. We're not seeing a ton of Mew EX in the format right now, so mm. it's probably not needed, but... Hey, if that comes up, if Squawk ever comes back in decks, it could be a good piece for the deck to have. Absolutely. Um, and Jake, taking a look at some of these lists that made day two, are you seeing any inconsistencies? Would you suggest playing it if you really love uh, water and ice Pokemon or, or if you're scared of Iron Hands still? Um, is this a deck to definitely have on your radar going into Orlando? I, I think I think it's a deck to, to keep mind of when you're building anything in this format uh, it's a very it's probably the has the most uh sort of high roll potential like if you mm -hmm. get everything perfectly you're going to win basically every game um you have such insane combos with chen pao yeah. can one shot anything iron hands takes extra prize cards um but yeah it, it's a it's a tough deck to play um perfectly and you do really need to play perfectly if you're going to get games off of good charizard players um and i i think uh one of the problems with the deck though looking forward is sort of ancient box if that becomes more popular it's a bit of a tough right. matchup uh, that's one place the the kyogre actually helps a little bit um if you play like a hand disruption card and then kyogre uh, you can sort of bring uh, like greninja active and then uh one shot their attacker off the bench mm -hmm. um if they're sort of running low on energies uh the energy is built up in play and then steal a turn back there. Uh, but it's not a, not a very consistent strategy. Right. Um, 
So yeah, probably not worth the space, but it's something to look into. Um, aside from that, I think uh, I think Chen Pao is going to probably uh, lower down in its play rate for Orlando specifically, uh, but I, I think it'll be back up by the time we get Indy and uh, the other European um, regionals. Mm -hmm. uh, just because because uh, Chen Pao didn't have like that high placements, uh, no top 16s this time. Um, so I think it'll be dropping down a little bit, but it, it still deserves to be uh, pretty high. It's got a good matchup into Tina without the Bennett, uh, which is a which is something to to take note of. Got it. Very cool. I mean, you're right. I think that the more and more people are using Chen Pao, the the lines are becoming you know significantly more difficult to you know get out on the field because it is a a deck that you have to really pay attention to your numbers in. Right. And not everybody will be able to just pick it up without grinding games out. Um, but I want to kind of shift the conversation a little bit more to a deck that is a little bit easier, I feel, uh, to just pick up and go to a, an event with. And, and Ethan, I want you to touch on this. We saw a lot of arc decks in the format come back out. You know, we did also see, you know, some top performing Arceus decks. There's the Vulpix one, there's Gudra. We saw. Arceus Armor Rouge perform. Um, Arctina showed up in pretty decent numbers too. Uh, what are we thinking about Arceus decks? Are they best or the best decks for beginners to go to a bigger regional event? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I think whether you're a beginner or you're a player who's good, it's always important that when you're playing at these level events, you're playing a deck that you know in and out right. rather than just playing the deck because it wins the spreadsheet, right? You need to have both exactly. things to really be successful in an event. So for players who want a more linear and straightforward deck, I mean, Arceus, it does that, right? Starbirth mm -hmm. is just inherent consistency. Uh, Trinity Nova and power up your, your big guy to swing is a good strategy. And Judge is a great way to disrupt. However, I think the biggest thing we're seeing is that for decks that can sort of navigate around that and have counterplay, the deck can sort of fall flat a little bit in terms of how it performs later on in the game, what happens when Arceus's get chased down, what happens mm -hmm. if Giratina's not able to put pressure on, or Armor Rouge, but especially at the beginning of the format, we've seen Arceus still be successful. It's just, it's been like this for a while, for mm -hmm. the three years that Arceus has now been legal for at the start of a format. So right. it's not to say Arceus can't go the distance, it's not to say to count Arceus out, but I think for a lot of people, especially with how popular Arceus Giratina was and with how poorly it converted at day two, and then also in terms of super high placements. Uh, I think if you're a beginner, yes, play a deck that you know how to play, and Arceus is not a bad deck by any means, but it kind of just falls in the middle. It's not an amazing deck. It's not the worst deck either, but it's mm -hmm. somewhere towards the middle, bottom, middle of the pack. Got it. And, and I definitely would agree with that statement for sure. Um, now, Jared, I'm going to hop back over to you a little bit and talk about these texts that were put in the deck. Um, obviously, Arctina didn't have too many texts. We did get the Iron Leafs. Same thing with Giratina V-Star. Uh, got Iron Leafs as a grass attacker to combat Charizard. Uh, we did see Arc Armor Rouge to combat control a little bit more too i feel like that's a, a great matchup for them i think honestly most arc decks are pretty good into control uh and then you did have the del fox v in that arc armor rouge deck to give that bench sniping uh ability to an arc deck which generally doesn't have that it gives you more counterplay what are we thinking about these techs are those going to be probably the top two decks or do you think that we'll see something new in orlando yeah, I definitely think that, uh, well, the Arc Armor deck is really interesting. I actually hit one day too. Mm -hmm. And as uh, a Chenpao player, I'm like, yippee. <laughs> and I was just like very happy to see an Arceus deck without uh, Giratina. I was like, okay, right. so I killed the one with the max spell and then I'm chilling. Mm -hmm. um, I think he took a game off me. And I was like, I think we were at a game three and I was just like, every single line this guy did, it was just like, what the heck? I didn't even, like he used Mew to copy Moonlight Shuriken to right. kill Fridge and then 90 on Chen Pao, which he followed up with like a Stone Edge. I was just, or the Power Edge. I was just like, what? I was like, <laughs> okay. Um, so I definitely think, and then also like he, uh, he almost won by like an Iono Delphox Knight My Bib, mm -hmm. which I definitely did not see coming out of right. nowhere. Um, I think you can definitely 
go pretty far on day one just because it's a shock factor of not only can you play these conventional uh attacks and of course like i don't even think he dropped this in our game but i think he and every arc armor Rouge player ran like gouging fire like i think oh, that's yeah. like pretty solid as well um and just kind of like um it's just like all these like amazing cards that's like depending on the scenario uh you can just really uh bring in whatever you need also the jet energies are really good yeah because not only do you have you know these fire energies you can bring to the active but you have the jet as well that you can bring um potentially like an i think it's playing like armor ex you know you yeah. can do a lot of damage with that you can bring up that gouging fire while keeping the energy on the uh the rcs or just bring up your attacker while leaving up the energy um and obviously it's just it's just kind of a deck that just kind of comes out of nowhere and does these kind of weird wacky combos um and then obviously you just have arctina and arctina is you know arctina and um and just does arctina things right. so and then jake i'm gonna go over to you and and talk a little bit more um about some of the things that we didn't necessarily see and why so we obviously saw over in japan uh Arc Vulpix was a deck, and we didn't necessarily see that come out as a surprise play. I think it's a, a relatively known deck that was there to counter Charizard, and Charizard being one of the biggest decks. Um, and then we Arc Gudra, which I think is the the most suboptimal, but also funny and um, you know f- fanboy ish version of, <laughs> of the Arceus decks. Right now, it's for people that really just love Gudra and they can't wait to play it again. Uh, why do you think that we didn't see decks like that come in here and, and we most likely won't see them in Orlando? Uh, I mean, I, I think the sort of arc plus wall card, um, mm-hmm. like Gudra or Vulpix, is pretty weak to uh, like double counter catcher or counter catcher boss. Like that sort of double gust effect to reset um, reset the protection effects. Um, so I'm not, not a too not a big fan of those decks. I think especially with like Iron Bundle in, in a bunch of decks now too. Um, it, it, they're just not countering enough of the format. Uh, Gudra has like a little bit more of a, a place now that uh, I, like I, I'd expect Ancient Box to go up a little bit, mm-hmm. um, and Gudra's pretty good against that. Uh, very, right. very good against that. Um, but one deck that we we haven't mentioned that uh, did very well at EUIC, the twenty eighth place Arceus deck. Um, oh. I love it. It's like an Arceus control sort of deck. Um, there's Luxray V in it, uh, mm-hmm. Lightning Energies, Mew EX, uh, the okay. Slacking V plus Spiritomb. There's a Flutter main, main in there, three okay. Eerie, three Grabber, TM Devolution, Hero's Cape. Um, so th- this deck, I-, I-, I think, has a lot of potential. Um, like, I- I'm a huge fan of this. Uh, sort of like one of, the- one of the things you can do against Charizard with this deck is uh, try and dismantle their engine um, and then get like a a paralysis off on on some Charizards. Right. You can um, this deck doesn't really have a way to one shot Charizard outside of the Mew EX, uh, but you can get those paralysis plays off. Um, it's probably got a, a a decent Chen Pao matchup with the Eerie Grabber Luxray right. uh, start to start the game. Um, Spiritomb uh, can can brick Charizards pretty often. Mm-hmm. Your control matchup's pretty good. Um, I think the the ancient box matchup can also be pretty good depending on how many um, sh- like Sharon's care healing cards you play. Um, this this deck only played one um, and one pal pad, but you could throw in like a second to improve your your ancient box matchup a lot. Um, but yeah, I think there's a there's a lot of room here for sort of a, a more control style Arceus deck, and I think this is a trend for uh, all decks in this format really. Um, Anything with like an engine, uh, like the barrel or, or mm-hmm. Pidgeot, um, sort of leaning towards these control plays, um, more more cards like Eerie and uh, TM Devolution to disrupt decks, um, I think is is very powerful in this format, mm-hmm. um, and that that makes me pretty excited because I think I think when those cards are making their way into um, sort of aggressive decks, uh, the format gets really interesting. Um, where you sort of have multiple routes to to win, you're not doing the same thing every game. Uh, one different one card in your opponent's discard pile being there could completely change how you're going to play the game. Um, and yeah, I, I hope to see more of that going forward. 
Yes, and that definitely piques my interest for sure, You're looking at Arceus as a pretty vanilla card, uh, having all those extra pieces and parts being added to it. And, and you know, you say control and I jump. Um, but <laughs> we'll take a look and hopefully we'll see something spicy show up over at Orlando. So moving on, we're going to talk about what we are predicting for the top three uh, of the MetaShare over in Orlando. So we're going to hit it back off to you, Ethan. What are going to be your top three predictions for the MetaShare when we see that graphic for day one? Uh, number one, pretty easy with Zard. I think that's no question. Uh, number two, it's tough because I think CPAO will probably have a fall off and I think so will probably Lugia. I could honestly see either Iron Hands or Giratina V Star making it up there. So I think okay. I'll do my number two and number three is Gira V Star and Iron Hands. I mean, okay. I could still definitely see like one of those decks sneak in and then C Pow be at the number three slot, but I think Lugia probably has a bigger dip off than C Pow does in terms of play. So I'll go a little bit unconventional. See gotcha. it that way. Very cool. All right. And then Jared, what do you think that your top three predictions for the meta share would be? So obviously Zard number one, uh, number two probably Tina, uh, mm -hmm. just because I think a lot of people are just saw Brandner's finish and are like just gonna run with it, uh, and then yeah number three I have no idea because I was expecting Champa to be played at EUIC it was weird, uh, I think I think hands like it's either gonna be hands or Pow for sure but again like I, I feel like I feel like Europe likes Pow a lot more. So yeah. I don't know. Maybe maybe I'll be proved wrong, though, but I think it's going to be Hans' number three. Gotcha. Now, Jake, would you agree, disagree with those top three? Yeah, I think I, I very much agree. I like to sort of think of, like, MetaShare uh, as sort of like a, in the, the tier list format a little more, where I think, like, Zard is definitely that that top tier deck. Um, and then there's quite a few, like, the the second top the second to top tier uh, deck, like Chen Pao, uh, the Hans deck, Giratina, um, and yeah, I, I think those, like all those decks will be around, uh, probably like 10 to, to 12%, somewhere in that gotcha. range with the, the chars are definitely on top, uh, 20 plus percent. Um, and then, then towards the bottom, the, the like ancient box and, and lost box and Lugia. Um, but yeah, definitely not, not like falling off or anything. And I think, um, ancient box is going to be more popular than last time, but it wasn't played very much at UIC. So it might take a little while to get up to like a, a peak. Um, so even though a lot of people will, will pick up the deck for Orlando, it, it probably won't reach those uh, the top three. But but it'll be more of a, a deck you should you should worry about. Gotcha. And I I definitely would agree. Also, I think that that's uh, that's going to be the majority of what you should be testing against if you are going to Orlando. Uh, make sure that you've got a decent matchup at least into two of those three decks that were mentioned for top three. If you are choosing a deck, uh, and also again make sure that you are comfortable with said deck to going into a field of semi randomness because there are a lot of good decks in the format in this new. Uh, updated format after rotation too, as we saw at EUIC. So uh, definitely something to keep your eye on the stream for uh, Pokemon's official stream to see what does show up in numbers. Uh, but I want to get to my favorite segment of these metaphor casts, which is the rogue decks. Favorite rogue decks. Uh, we're going to start back off with you, Jared, on what your favorite rogue deck uh, you'd like to see do well. Maybe you're too scared to play this deck at a major um but let me know what your thoughts on what you'd like to see well for me it always used to be chimp Pal, but that's not a rogue deck anymore no. i'm gonna i'm gonna go with gold dango on okay. this one we you gotta see we gotta okay. see some dango i I've, I've i've been on and off on dango uh <laughs> but i guess people are like i'm just like i don't know how it beats zard and uh, people are like nah we're fine i'm just like all right prove it then uh, so I want to see Dango. The Gamillas must have got to you in the Church of Dango here. <laughs> the Church, yeah, I know. Yeah, the Church says every matchup is favored. Right. So, all right, and then Ethan, over to you. What do you think that your favorite rogue deck that you'd love to see do well uh, would be? Mm. I think if we still consider Ancient as I don't know if we even consider Ancient as rogue anymore, though, man, it's probably not like a, a rogue deck. 
Maybe some uh, Espathra action. Ooh, okay. I'd be down for some Espathra. Yeah, I saw the. Oh, like we thought it'd be a Zard, and then I watched on stream it just completely <laughs> body Zard two O though. So yeah. you know what? I could be a believer, right? So I'll That's go right. with Espathra. Espathra like. Banette is just a, a wacky combo. I just want it to work, right? Um, <laughs> so over to you, Jake. Any any sort of uh, uh, either big brain deck or just cool wacky decks you'd like to see do well. I mean, yeah, I'd love to see sort of that that arc deck that I was mentioning before, yeah. the arc control stuff, see more success. Um, we we didn't even talk about it in the podcast though, but Gardevoir is sort of uh, oh, yeah. out of the the rogue that. territory, I think. After this, no, tournament. it's still rogue. Uh, it's, it's a bit, rogue. it's a bit rogue, but um, yeah, it's it's a very different deck from last format. Right. Um, but it's uh, it's got some rough matchups against lost vacuum and then some great <laughs> matchups against not lost vacuum yes um so uh, if you're not expecting lost vacuum index then you know gardevoir is a gardevoir gardevoir is a good play if, yep. if that happens um but yeah I, I think um yeah there's a there's a lot of potential in this format for sort of that control mix plus other stuff uh, mm. So I, I I always love to see those decks. Attack and control decks are sort of my favorite yeah. um, play style in the game, um, yeah. where yeah you're not full on control, but um, like even even more so than like the Radiant Charizard Pidgeot um, deck, like even more uh, attacking stuff like this Arceus deck um, are sort of where where I I love to play if they are good. Um, so I'll have to put more time into that deck. Absolutely, and I I know that. Uh... Gardevoir was definitely going to be my number one pick, so you took the words out of my mouth there. I, I've always loved Control, but um, I feel like Control is a little bit more known uh, to just come up and surprise somebody now uh, because we've seen so much of it. But Gardevoir, I'd love to see that just body something on stream. I think that would be hilarious. Um, uh, the other deck, I, I always forget the name of what this card is, and I know I've had it sitting on my desk here, and uh, I've seen a couple of content creators uh, stream it, but Bramble Ghast is another one I think that would be very funny into Charizard. I don't think it's a very good deck, but I do think that it would be nice to see on stream. Uh, just surprising some people because it is a grass attacker. So, oh, I'd like to shout out. Uh, sorry, What's I it? think one of my other favorite rogue decks is I don't know if it's I guess it's rogue Ursa Luna Control. Oh, yes. That deck, that deck's sick. <laughs> I saw someone playing next to me. I was like, that is the coolest thing ever. I want that to do well. Right, right. Uh, Ursa Luna. It was a dual Ursa Luna deck. Yeah, it had, or like Ursa Ring and Ursa Luna. So it had no like. Well, I, they like played the they like played the Ursa Luna just with the Pete Hunt, but then it also runs reversals, yes. so it can just like it's Hit like the attacking things. thing it's too. It's crazy. Yeah. Yes, I I do like that deck a lot. Uh, so it's something if you are into control decks and you're watching this meta forecast, something to look into for sure. I do uh, I do think that that could be funny. Uh, and and we'll just uh, wait on bated breath for uh, Blood Moon Ursa Luna EX to come out in the next format for control decks to just uh, jump to maybe the twenty percent meta <laughs> share after. Yeah. Uh, well, any deck yeah like, well any deck nice. literally any deck um but yeah so i mean this has been a great meta forecast hopefully you got a lot out of it i'm gonna let everybody here give their shout outs uh let you know where you can find them here so we'll start back off with you jake where can everybody find you and any shout outs you'd like to give yeah i mean you can find me uh, on twitter or whatever it's called x <laughs> uh at jake k gearheart or search my name um uh, and shout out to uh, Dead Draw Gaming, my uh, sponsor. Um, so yeah, check check them out uh, and check our articles out. Um, yeah, I'm always uh, always happy to to join on a on a Shuffle Squad podcast. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and Ethan, where can everybody find you? And any shout outs you'd like to give? Oh yeah, I get make sure you guys follow me at Hegster TCG on X. Yeah, for calling it that nowadays. <laughs> and uh, yeah. I've, that's all I got to say. Thanks for having me on, PJ. Yeah, not a problem. And Jared, anybody uh, you want to shout out here? Uh, well, first, you can find me on Jay Gramsie on Twitter. And uh, shout out to... Um, who's going to shout out? Oh, yeah. Everyone, all the Shinfa believers. We did it. <laughs> we're, we're a deck now. We made it it took too long. But we're finally a real deck. Yay. 
Awesome. And thank you again one last time here. And thank you also for watching. Make sure that you do like uh, if you want to see more content like this, you're hitting the subscribe button and comment down below if you did believe in anything that any one of our lovely guests did have to suggest or comment on. Uh, we love reading those comments and helping you out decide what deck you'll be playing for your next major event or maybe even your local event here too. That's all I have to say for you here on the Shuffle Squad. I'm PJ signing off here and we will catch you next time. Want to support the Shuffle Squad? Be sure to check out all of our sponsors in the description to pick up Pokemon TCG singles, sealed, and PTCG live codes. You made it to the end. Thank you so much for watching this entire video from the Shuffle Squad. Honestly, from the bottom of our hearts, we appreciate each and every person that supports our content, watches what we have going on every single day, every single week, even from time to time, and uh, continuously allows us to have a forum to project our creative content towards the Pokemon TCG community. So if you haven't already, be sure to give this video a like, subscribe to the channel, and even leave a comment to help boost the YouTube algorithm. That being said, we'll catch you with our next video. Thanks again. Take it easy.